Yeah, I'll start with just, I guess, um, you know, a lot of people saw you guys um, outside of the courthouse every day. You guys were here working every single day, morning to night. Um, what did you, what were you guys doing out here? Kind of walk people through what you guys were doing and um, how was it, you know, kind of being this close to the case that you all worked on for the trial? Uh, go to first. Okay. If not, I'll keep talking. Well, our, our mornings, you know, we were part of the security detail outside the courthouse. So, you know, our priorities were getting the jury in, the judge in, all the attorneys from the AG's office, and of course, Alec. So. Yeah, morning routine pretty much went the same every single day. Mm -hmm. That was how it was kind of designed to work. So, just kind of kept it organized. How did y'all start the morning? Uh, well, he was always here yeah, first. Mm -hmm. By the time I get here, and I was usually, you know, second or so, he would, so had already been here thought. half an hour at least. Yeah. So. Like, what, about like what, six, six thirty, seven? I, I started at six. Time. I started at six thirty. The majority of them arrived seven, seven thirty. What time were you getting done at the end of the day? Those first couple of nights were long, yeah. while they were picking jurors. But on average, uh, you know, Judge Newman said in the beginning that. He wasn't going to keep the jurors long past 5.30, and he was pretty much on the mark. You know, by the time um, they let out, which was usually 5.30, 5.45, there's still 90 minutes of work after that with the, you know, the securing of Alex at the jail, getting the jurors back to their vehicles, the judge cleared out, the property straight, all the barricades back up, all the markers and all the secure parking spots. Um, Everything closed yeah, up. <laughs> hey, the media was great. Yeah, yeah they really were. Yeah, you guys kind of pieced yourselves and made our job easy. We were very impressed. Mm -hmm. Changed the opinion of a lot of law enforcement for media. Yeah, that's nice Big to deal. hear. Yeah. Big deal. Mm -hmm. That's really nice to that's hear. That's not being you nice. I'm being, I'm being lot. serious. Yeah. No, it, it did. Mm -hmm. It was wonderful. Yeah. We were expecting to have to hold people back a lot more than what we did. Mm -hmm. There was not, like, almost none of that. So. We literally... We laid out the boundaries and the media police themselves. They would catch someone and say, hey, you can't stand there. Don't always, park there, back up. You could always tell when there was a new person there because they would cross the line. Mm -hmm. Everyone else was just kind of, all right, we don't do that. <laughs> Before we could even say anything, yeah. they had it under control. <laughs> yeah, we're bossy. We're like, <laughs> well, we had one guy at the end. It was like the, I don't know, was, you know, like two days before the, you know, the end. And he went through the, the, the red zone. And I caught him out the corner of my eye, and as I turned to say something to him, he almost got tackled. Mm -hmm. By a ser and I'm serious. Mm -hmm. Somebody yelled, scared me. It was another cameraman, okay. ran up, grabbed him, pulled him away. And uh, I asked him later, I said, we appreciate it, but are y'all like that everywhere? And he said, what you don't understand is he messes it up. You move everybody 30 feet back. So everybody gets blanketed punishment. So we didn't, it wasn't bad. Well, we've all been in these situations where we do see someone screw up. I mean, like, we had that happen in the courthouse a couple mm -hmm. of times in the courtroom where iPads were taken away, yeah. you know, and all that kind of stuff. So we're, right. we were definitely like, please don't take anything <laughs> else away from us. <laughs> so that was good. Yeah. But the, uh, the security was a big deal. I mean, you were dealing with a very high-profile yeah. case here. Um, and really, no joke, like Judge Newman just protecting him and keeping that courthouse safe, that must have weighed heavily on you all. It was a big feat, and that's one of the questions we've been asked the most. How, how did it run so smooth? And it, it ran so smooth because of all these guys, um, but months of preparation. It was probably, probably one of the larger undertakings. You know, the, the, the size of the operation itself, it's large, but it's not massive when you look at the grand scheme of things. But the, the amount of planning that had to go into it, the thing, the barricade system up front just to keep people moving, um, what parking spaces were going to be designated for emergency operations. If we had a problem inside, how are we going to get paramedics or firefighters inside or criminals out? Or, But just, I mean, literally we met once a week for two months prior. Um, and, and that's just on our side. You know, they had the uh, food truck deal and the power, you know, all of us said we had power and internet and all, all of those individuals, they had their hands full too, but we literally started a good two and a half months in advance on security. But 
we wanted it run and we wanted it practiced and we wanted everything done so when it was time to start, we didn't have any flaws. And I couldn't have been happier because, you know, what was it, two weeks in we had a bomb threat and it was, I mean, it, it worked like a, a stopwatch, man. It was great. We had no yeah, issues. Like, of course, we got a bomb threat. We got a bomb yeah. threat scare from a guy from a, from a jail called again, yeah. right? Exactly. Of all the things in the world. Yeah. Did you ever find out what he was up to? Not, not, and we haven't, we haven't bailed on that. We haven't stopped. The, you know, the investigation's ongoing. Um, the problem is we're into the electronic forensics part of it, and it takes forever. You know, do we have the right guy? Yes. Do we have the device that the call was made from? Yes. How did that happen so quick? Like, get, tying it back to that guy in that jail, got his phone. You know, it was pretty quick. You guys put out the release with the update. Mm -hmm. How was that so quick? Well, the first part of it was evac. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're proud. We pretty much had the, the entire property evacuated in five minutes, which is a pretty big deal considering the number of people that were here. Uh, the jurors and the judge were relocated to a secure location, uh, so secure that we had to remind some of our personnel where it was because, you know, during that transfer. But, you know, they were, they were quickly moved without issue um, they were taken care of, actually fed lunch remotely at that facility. And as soon as those priorities were off and uh, Alex was secured at the detention center, we came right back to the trailer where y'all saw us for six weeks and it started right there. And it was, you know, we brought in representatives from the local phone company, from county IT, uh, SLED, the sheriff's office. We had, you know, city police department and city fire. Yeah, exactly. Everybody here helping with the, the evacuation part, and then all the detectives in the trailer working on trying to get work back to the source. And there was like two or three of us on, a, on the phone, each of us talking to a different analyst on the other end, and then we just kind of combined all, everything that we got, and um, SLED agents were able to pinpoint where the, the phone was coming from, and we all just worked together, and within six hours, we, we had it, so. I am so interested. Oh, yeah. Or why he did it that day too. So do we want to move to um, your first work as uh, officers on the scene? Should sure. we go straight into that? Um, who got the first call? Well, I was the first one there, so <laughs> I guess that would be me. So do you want to talk about what happened on when you got the call to go to Moselle? Did you know where you were going? Um, so I obviously I knew where I was going as far as an address. Uh, who was going to be there, like who the caller actually was. You know, they said, I don't even think dispatch told me the name of the radio. I don't believe they did, but um, I had no idea who it was. I had never even been to that specific address on Moselle before. I'd obviously been down Moselle Road, but I had never been called to that address or that family or anything. Um, you know, I think I was actually not too far from the courthouse when I originally was dispatched that call. Um, so I would have been coming from right over here on Hampton Street. Um, so you know, it's gonna, I knew it was gonna take me every bit of close to 20 minutes to get out there, even running lights and sirens, because that type of call you're gonna run lights and sirens to. Um, it's, you know, it's way out in the middle of nowhere. So, uh, you know, I just had no idea who they were. You know, I get on scene, had never seen this guy before. I didn't remember ever seeing him on the news or anything like that, even with the whole boat crash thing. Like, I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to that news story, so it's not like I remembered him from that. Um, but as soon as he mentioned the boat crash theory to me, it clicked. Okay, that's who this is. That's this family. But until then, I had no idea who they were. And um, one thing that kind of stuck out to me, and I think you were saying this in court, you you know you're pulling up to the scene or walking up or something and it's alex standing there in the two bodies what like how was he acting was it typical um like what was his demeanor when you pulled up and saw him and his family members i mean he was obviously extremely stressed i mean really worked up just kind of all over the place um it, and it's hard to gauge someone's reactions in a situation like that because and they'll tell you this, any homicide scenes as we've been on, there's such a wide variety of how 
victims' families and or suspects that might still be there are acting. Um, you know, the human emotion is just so unpredictable. Um, but you know, getting there, walking up, you know, I, Paul was laying on the ground on my left, and now he was on the right, and just you know, he's standing, you know, I don't know, 10, 15 yards from where they were, and he just kind of pacing all over the place and just immediately wanted to start trying to figure out, or he wanted to start putting blame on something, so. Did you think that was like different? Um, and were you worried about someone, I mean, you're in the middle of the country, it's, it's late at night, it's super dark out there. Were you worried that someone was gonna pop up on the scene? Like, were you, was he worried about that? So, it, anytime you show up to a scene like that, that, that thought is always going to be there. Uh, but the way that the call came in where, you know, I got home, found them dead. Now I'm, and he'd been out there for at least 20 minutes before I got there because whenever I got the call, I, that's about how long it took me to get there. Uh, so generally if something else were to happen, you know, if somebody else had been there, something else would have already happened before I got there. They're not gonna wait for law enforcement to get there to try anything. Generally. So you weren't nervous. You weren't like thinking, oh my gosh, there could be a killer on the loose on this property right now. Or you trained to handle that kind of stress. Um, I mean, like I said, the, the thought is always there, but I handle high stress situations like that fairly well. Um, you know, I, I'd been doing road patrol for five years, four or five years at that point. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't anything brand new. It's not the first time I've come first on scene to a homicide. Um, so it's nerve wracking in a way, but you know, I had 17 minutes or roughly of driving on my way there to already, you know, I'm running, I've ran through a hundred scenarios in my head at that point of what happened. You know, you're, you're already thinking about things before you get to the call, Just any call you get dispatched to, even, you know, a simple alarm call, you're running through every possible scenario. Am I going to get there? Did a cat set off the alarm or am I going to get there and the front door is going to be kicked in? So any kind of call like that, you're already running through all the scenarios in your head, preparing for whatever you're gonna come up on. Um, How bad was this scenario? Um, there was a lot of different options running through my head of what could have happened or what I'm about to walk into. Um, but he, dispatch kind of did a pretty good job of telling me, you know, he's out there on scene. They've been clearly shot. Um, and he's been out there for 20 minutes already, so I'm not expecting to walk into a gunfight, obviously. Um, and because I didn't know who the family was, because none of this kind of triggered anything in my head of this is gonna end up being a huge thing, you know, the initial thought wasn't he killed his wife and son. Like, that, that, that wasn't really one of the scenarios going through my head on my way there because he called and said, I found them like this. So you, generally when you get a call like that, you go into it thinking that's the truth, so. Um, and I think all of you guys maybe talked about this, but you said that around the bodies there was blood and then water. Is that different or is that normal? Did you notice that right off the bat? Me, me walking up on scene, I, you know, I obviously noticed the, a lot of blood around each of them. Uh, the water that was kind of around Paul's body um, didn't really, those minor details aren't something you're looking at when you're walking into a, a homicide scene when you first get there. Obviously, once more people are getting there and you've got time to actually gauge what's going on, but you know, I'm doing more, I need to see everything going on right now. I need to, I got to keep my eyes on the dark woods, the, you know, the shed off in the distance, the any kind of headlights that might be popping up from a vehicle that might be driving up that's not supposed to be driving up. Basically anybody that doesn't have red or blue lights probably doesn't need to be pulling up. So, you know, I'm, I'm looking for all of that kind of stuff. So I'm not, it, it's not like I walked past Paul's body and saw the water and thought, oh, that's weird. You know, that didn't really trigger for me. So when did, Jason and Laura, when did you start coming together as a team to be in this space? Who, who got the next call if we just stayed in a chronological order? Well, the, uh, <clears throat> yeah, the, uh, 
I actually heard the call over the radio when it came out and I knew that I was going to be getting a phone call and I literally was, you know, putting my gear on and walking to the door and the phone rang and it was dispatch. And I told him, I heard the call, I'm getting in the car right now. And after I got in the vehicle and began heading to the call, uh, the sheriff called and he asked me if I knew who the caller was and I you know, I said, no boss, I haven't. All, all that was given to me was same information that was over the radio. And he said, um, dispatch says it's Alex Murdoch. And the sheriff and I, where we live, put us closer to the scene than the rest of the detectives and administration. So I, by then I had heard Daniel and his team going on scene and confirming you know, two fatalities. So we went ahead and did a, an all call, and that would have been when uh, you know Laura got the call. And I wasn't that far from the scene. I believe I was only six minutes, I think, six or seven minutes behind Daniel's team when they arrived. And um, you know they did the, the necessary stuff, making sure that there wasn't a bad guy on scene, wielding a gun, hiding in the bushes, Securing the crime scene, um, you know, evac and anybody that wasn't absolutely necessary inside the crime scene out to preserve evidence so that when we finally got there, we could start doing what we were going to do. But I wasn't, I believe I got there at um, right after 1030. And the sheriff and I arrived about the same time. You're and Alex Murdoch, what, did you, what went through your head? Well, initially, I do know Alec. Uh, I don't, uh, we're not, I mean, we're not really close, but I know the family. I've been here my whole life. Um, so I was aware of some of the other factors that were going on at the time, the, you know, the boat case and stuff. I, it was not my thought in route to the call that Alec had done anything to his wife or his son. So I was preparing myself for some type of scenario where someone had come there and done something. That's, that's what I really was anticipating when I got there. And, you know, I pulled in and parked, uh, met with the sheriff real quick and did a, a quick walk through and basically walked right straight through the scene over to, uh, to Daniel and spoke to Daniel and spoke to Alec and just kind of absorbing what I was seeing on the way through and making some quick determinations. You know, we knew that we had a weather front coming in. Um, we're, where we were is far away from town. So anything that you're gonna need, you need to go get now. So, you know, I knew that Laura had the longest drive and is probably one of the best as far as putting stuff on paper, making it sound good. So, you know, she was routed to the office for search warrant because we knew we were gonna have to have a search warrant. And um, I sent other officers to get like a tent and you know the truck with all the equipment on it, stuff like that. But you know those were being those were the things that were being determined right up front. Once we knew that we had a scene and that it was was secure, and it wasn't until we made those first determinations and the determination to call sled that you really started soaking in what you were seeing as far as evidence. What? Yeah, what, what were you seeing and what were your initial thoughts when you got there? So probably, how long was it before you got there with the warrant? Probably 11.30, I think. Mm -hmm. I was gonna say within about an hour, and I was the first one, I'll go ahead and say it, I was the first one that, that didn't like some of the things that I saw. And I was the first one looking at Alec as a suspect. It wasn't, I mean, that wasn't public knowledge. You know, it, it was obviously by this time we have requested SLED and that was not because of the Murdoch name. It was simply because he worked for the 14th Circuit Solicitor's Office and it makes it where we have, in order for us to be transparent, we have to notify SLED. So, that call was immediate. Once we confirmed it was Alex, confirmed it was his wife and his son, then that phone call was made. And of course they get spun up and they have to drive there. So it's not immediate. 
And so we begin processing at that time. Now we won't remove evidence and we won't collect it, but as far as mapping it out, identifying it, uh, marking it, photographing it, things like that, we'll, we go ahead and start processing. We have a great relationship with SLED. Uh, it, on smaller scenes, it's not unusual for them if we actually call them for them to get here and pretty much everything's done. And then we do it again with them. Then we go all the way through the whole process again and they physically collect uh, or remove. So that's what we started. We started the identification of evidence or potential evidence, protection of evidence from the elements. Um, I went ahead and requested that the 911 call be sent to me and I did speak briefly with Alex. And it was after an initial look at the evidence, the phone call and the talk to Alex that bothered me. Uh, I said it on the stand, his demeanor is, there, there were red flags everywhere between his 911 call and his body language. Talk to us about that. What are, what are the red flags? And, and possibly, I mean, now that you're off the stand, sure. feel free to tell us, like, <laughs> however, I mean, well, the, whatever that looks like, you know, in, in your own sort of sure. words. As far as, the, as far as Maggie and Paul, shell casings, things like that, at that time, you're not looking at those items and they're not telling you a story that Alec did it. That's not what we were looking at. Um, and it's very obvious that both of them were killed by gunshot uh, or they had gunshot wounds and that they, they died from those gunshot wounds. It was very obvious that there were 300 blackout casings on the ground. Uh, very obvious that um, it appeared to be a shotgun wound to Paul, but we didn't know that for sure until we got into the room and started processing later. So those things weren't taken into account. What was taken into account by me was um, Alex's body language. So it is hard, like Daniel mentioned before, if you don't know someone to determine, are they truly emotionally upset? Are they truly crying? Are they faking? But regardless of whether you know someone or not, you can determine a baseline. And a baseline can be, um, it can be the emotion. It can be upset. You know, Daniel gets there and he's obviously visibly shaking. That can be his baseline. But right off the bat, and there's a great example on um, Daniel's body camera of, I mentioned before, it's called either stop sign or, or red light emotions. And what I mean by that is you can't, if you're truly upset, you can't stop it like that and change direction. And he was upset talking to Daniel and just doing the crying, doing the emotion, heavy breathing, and he stops. And he says, how are you doing, sir? You can't do that. Um, that one thing is not it. That's, you know, everybody says, well, was that it? it? It's a whole conglomerate of things. But that was one of the first ones that I saw. As soon as I walked up, he spoke to me and it, and it so I thought maybe he's just upset. It is his wife, it is his child. It's the other things when you take into account. He won't look at you when he's talking to you. Again, by itself doesn't mean anything, but usually when somebody fixates their eyes and they answer questions, it's more of a recap of what they're remembering. Usually someone that's come upon a scene like that and they're, you ask a question, what did you see when you got here? As they talk, their eyes are bouncing all over because they're they're looking for clues. They're accessing what they saw when they first walked up. I saw, I saw my wife Maggie, or I saw, I saw Paul. But you noticed when he was answering, he never looked at the person he was addressing. He always stared off into the direction, and he had a really, really low blink rate. Um, typically, someone who's in a high stress situation, their eyes are blinking a lot, and it was. It was weird to watch because he didn't blink. Um, so then we brought up the 911 call, and one of the things he says on the 911 call was that he had come to the residence and he had found his wife and his son dead. And the dispatcher is just at that point in time getting information. Doesn't slow the response. They're just gathering more, gathering more, feeding that to patrol that's on the way and also keeping the caller busy so that they're not getting upset or any more upset. And 
she asked about guns. Do you see any guns? And he says, no, I don't see any. And she says another question about the firearms, more or less hinting at maybe a um, suicide, a murder suicide. And he got real snappy there for a second and said, well, they didn't, it's not a suicide if that's what you're asking. Um, but how did he know that? I mean, how did he know there wasn't a gun under Paul? How did he know that Paul didn't shoot Maggie or Maggie didn't shoot Paul and then killed themselves? But everything was an unknown to him, but that was an immediate angry response. And I won't say angry, it was immediate response back. Um, so that was a little bit of a red flag, what, the way he answered that. But the biggest one was walking up to him after dispatch has told us, after the 911 call says it, um, and out of his own mouth he tells me that he physically went over and he checked both of them. And he's got on a pristine white t-shirt, he's got on a pair of shorts, a pair of shoes, he has no blood anywhere. And I have never been to a scene where a parent's found a child or a spouse has found their wife or their husband and they didn't go and try to save them. You know, you can imagine first pulling up and not knowing what's going on and for him not to have one speck of blood, it was an immediate, that was probably my biggest thing. That, that was it, it you know. And you know, Laurel will talk more about it in a minute, but not just, not on his shirt, but not on his fingers, not on the soles of his light colored shoes. Um, you asked Daniel, was there blood and water all around Paul? It was saturated everywhere. Um, but no blood. And, and then he says, when I went to check um, Paul, I got his phone out of his pocket and I was going to check it for Eb and he stopped and he didn't finish the sentence and then he said and then I realized I shouldn't do that and I put it down on his uh, backside and that's what he told me and then you know Laura will go into a little more detail of what was actually said in the interview which is close to that but um, his responses were just they weren't of someone in distress his and I could talk all day about his his body language, it, but just the body language alone and the no blood, the absolute no blood. Uh, I'm not saying that he did it, but I did. I readily told everybody that when we had our meeting before we went into process that we don't need to discount him. There's something, whether he did it himself or whether he stood here and watched or whether he paid somebody to do it or what, he was, he was part of it somehow. And so that was, that was where it started with me. Body language doesn't lie, does it? Like, it doesn't. There's just those things that we do innately. Is it like that fight or flight thing? What do they teach you about that when you were like, what, while you're sort of watching Alec talk to you, right. this is going, all of your training's coming back, isn't it? And a lot of the stuff I mentioned to you are things that we are taught through interview classes, but um, a lot of it's like we discussed earlier, it's, years and years and years of reading people. And a detective will tell you a lot of times, it doesn't matter what actually comes out of your mouth in the interview room, it's what your body says. Because we can have someone come in and sit down and say the typical, I swear I didn't do it, I swear I didn't do it, but their body says everything opposite. And I'll give you a great example. Uh, you know, when, when Alex was looking in the eyes of the jurors, and he said, I would never hurt my wife, Mag, or my son, Paul Paul. What was he doing? He was shaking his head up and down. That's not the response that you would expect from someone who's actually saying they didn't do it. Uh, subconsciously, he's reacting differently. That, I mean, go back and look at your own footage. I mean, obviously the whole nation saw it, but making that statement while shaking his head yes, is, is an indicator. So they were, there was a ton of them there. And just one, and I said it on the stand, just one of those indicators is not an indication of somebody lying. But all of them that were there, they painted a very, very clear picture for me. Just from 
spending 26 years of looking at people and interviewing people. That's, that's where that came from. Some of this you'll be able to go back and find on video. Um, a great example will be David Owens and uh, Laura Rutland interviewed that first interview um, in the vehicle. You can watch as he's talking to them, he's staring straight out the front window. The camera is mounted over to his left. And as he, they're asking him questions, he's doing that stare that I was telling you. It, it's, it's a re In other words, as long as he is inside that story that he's practiced in his head, he's sitting there staring out the window or straight ahead, eyes fixed, not blinking. The minute someone asked him a question, Laura asked him a question from the back seat that wasn't part of the routine, his, his body language completely changes. His tone changed, um, he, he turned. The best example is in the, uh, the second interview um, when they're in the car and he's recapping again and he stops for the first time and turns and looks at Agent Owens and says, so do y'all have any good leads? I think that was it, you know, do y'all have any, any good, good leads? That was the first time he had ever turned and made eye contact during the interview, because why? He wanted something from them. He wasn't recalling what he had done or what he remembered. He was, he was actually looking at them for information. Um, and then the last thing that was the nail in the coffin for me on scene was that he never got angry. And people say, well, why would that make you upset? But they always do. We don't take it to heart, we don't get offended, but if we had been out there and it was legitimate, at some point in time, he should have reached a peak moment where he said, why do y'all keep asking me the same questions? Why are you not out there trying to find the killers? Why are you sitting here taking pictures of dirt? Why are you doing this? Why aren't you doing your job? Um, never, ne not even up until he got convicted. He never, ever, ever showed that anger. And they, everyone does, they always do. They don't mean it, but it's, you know, it's their true feelings coming out of why are we wasting, why are we wasting time here? Why are you asking me the same questions over and over and over again? Never once. No, I mean, no, everything was yes, sir. Thank yeah, John you. Metters did an excellent job in the closing of pointing that out to the jury in, in his closing, his rebuttal. He, he pointed out how Alec never said, call Buster, call, someone call my son, someone's out there. Someone go check on my mom in Almeida. I just left her, she's there by herself. There was none of that panic that night, none of it. And Laura, you were obviously in the car for the first interview. Mm -hmm. um, what was going through your mind? Had you heard about the family? Um, you know, we saw you like, I think comfort him at one point, or was that? Uh, just Owen? at the end, you like, when you were saying yeah. goodbye, I think you No, it was, um, he had broken down um, at the very beginning, um, trying to describe Paul when he came upon his body and what he had seen. He started to break down as he was describing how, you know, horrific it was and human nature I, I reached I reached for his shoulder um, but when I got to the scene um, I was basically briefed about who it was and I didn't know the Murdoch family uh, so I was assigned to assist da David Owen with SLED and pretty much right away because I got there so late because I had to get the search warrant we listened to the 911 call and it was hard to hear because it was from a cell phone, but we listened to it and we walked through and lifted up the blankets. Um, they were lifted up and we looked on at the bodies. Um, but initially we didn't really know what we had. You know, was this a murder-suicide? Were they ambushed? Were, you know, it could have been any scenario. So we went to Alec and Agent Owen explained, we need to speak with you. And he was with his attorneys and he said, that's totally fine, I understand. And so in the car, we were asking very generalized questions um, because for all I knew, there could have been a gun underneath Paul's body at that point. So, you know, when he was describing Paul and breaking down, I initially thought this was genuine emotion and genuine, genuine trauma. Of course, now I know, yeah, he was traumatized, but not by what he had found. He was traumatized of what he had done. Um, that's the advantage of being able to look back and watch the body cam and spend hours watching it over and over and over again and you pick up on those cues and 
so for me, it was probably the next few days before I was like really narrowing in on, on Alec. Um, but as far as his interview went, he was all over the place. He, he would cry, then he would stop crying. He was coughing. He was clearing his throat a lot, which he tended to do. And then a lie would follow. Um, that seemed to be the pattern. But he told us a story about um, Paul being bullied a lot but couldn't give any specific examples. He mentioned going to see his mother in Alameda at 9.30 at night, and she's got Alzheimer's. Well, everyone's heard of sundowners with Alzheimer's. They don't do well at night. Um, so I found that that was unusual. As well as his wild story about the groundskeeper, and you know, he used to kill Black Panther radicals. I mean, he was just all over the place, um, considering this was supposed to be somebody who had just found his wife and son brutally murdered. So a lot of his story that night just did not make sense. No, and you had a lot of people show up. I mean, it wasn't like you, were, you had the brothers come, and he got off the 911 call in order to call family. Is that something you normally do? Well, no, and that was one thing that I was going to mention, and we kind of shifted that the last part of the 911 call that was odd was that he tells dispatch, I'm going to go to my house and get a gun. It's only 100 yards away. Um, and of course, the house is a thousand feet away, not a hundred yards. But that wasn't the issue. Let's say that he is nervous. I've just come up there. You know, they're both dead. They're at the dog kennels. It's dark. I don't know who's out here. I'm going to go get a gun. And he goes to his house and he gets the gun and he comes back. And as soon as he gets back, he disconnects with dispatch to call family. So if if you're frightened enough that you have to go to the house and get a gun, why would you sever your contact with dispatch, your lifeline? Um, that was really, really, really odd. You know, I'm going to go to the house and get a gun because I don't know who's out here. Pulls back up, says, I'm going to make some phone calls. And he disconnects with 911. So that was the, the last flag that we were talking about on that 911 call. Um, you know, that gets your wheels spinning about why does he have to have the gun now? Was it, a, was he taking something there? Was he bringing something back? Was it just to get a gun in his hand so that he could excuse having GSR? Um, you know, what was going on there? But that's really weird to, to panic enough to have to leave and get a gun. But then as soon as you pull back up, um, say, okay, well, I'm gonna make some phone calls. So, yeah. Um. I forgot, I randomly just thought of this. He said that he had pills in his pockets during that first interview. He's, and when Daniel walked up. Yeah, today, he says he's like, Jason. yeah, like a drug addict or whatever, 50K a day on pills, full function. <coughs> um, <coughs> did you guys think he was acting like a drug addict or someone not at all. that had pills in their pocket? <clears throat> no, not at all. Mm -hmm. You searched him, didn't you? So when I first got there, I mean, one of the first things you see me do is check him just to make sure he doesn't have any weapons. I mean, that's something we do anytime we come onto a scene like that. He's the only one here. I've got two people that clearly suffer gunshot wounds. First, I want to make sure that I'm aware of any and all weapons that are out there. So, you know, he told me the shotgun's leaning up against his car. I'm just going to check him to make sure I don't see any weapon. You know, I'm not sticking my hands in his pockets to see what all he's got in there. I'm not doing a full search, just doing a quick pat down, making sure he doesn't have any weapons that I'm not aware of.